This episode is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your Raspberry Pi with our all-in-one arcade kit using genuine Sanwar arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. What do you call a collective of Amstrad computers? Answers in the comments section, please. Hello, cave dwellers, welcome to the cave. Yeah, what I've got on the table here is not just a random selection of Amstrad computers. There's something which connects them all, which is far more than just the brand name alone. And we're going to explore that in today's show and tell. A show and tell with just me, just because of the way the world is at the moment, it's better for me to do this on my own. I can't wait to have guests back in the cave and hopefully that day will come sooner rather than later. But you've just got me today and I'm gonna take you through these machines and this series, which starts with the Amstrad PC 1512, which is over here, and the one I've got set up here, which is the PC 1640. Now you have seen these machines on the channel before. There's a whole episode dedicated to these machines and I would encourage you to go and check it out. There'll be a link up there or in the video description. It's a really important machine for the progress of IBM PC compatibles because this was an IBM PC compatible-ish. It was like 99% IBM PC compatible on account of its uh, 8086 cloned CPU in there. It's CGA-ish video mode, which was CGA compatible, but also capable of displaying more colors at a higher resolution should software specifically be written to use that, which it rarely was. I don't think there are many examples at all which use that mode. But here's the key thing. It cost 499 pounds in 1986. And that was massively cheaper than any other IBM PC compatible of the time. And while it wasn't cutting edge in its spec, the PC1640 had 640K of RAM, the 1512 had 512K of RAM, uh, and this is a monochrome monitor here, but you can get a color one. So it was slightly behind the spec of the time. It was perfectly capable of doing what the owners wanted it to do. If you wanted to use WordStar on this thing with a nice 40 or 60 column text mode on the display, today you could sit down and quite happily write the next series of Game of Thrones with no eye strain, a nice keyboard, and you could save your files to floppy disk quite safely. It was a very functional machine, which, which got IBM PC compatibles into the hands of people who otherwise couldn't afford it. I say, there is already a video on the channel which you could check out to, uh, to get the full story on this machine. But I need to show it to you today because it is the foundation for the whole series of machines that are on the table here today. Because once Lord Sugar had launched this and had so much success with it across Europe, where do you go next? Where does a successful PC salesman go next after a desktop PC? of course, portable computing. And so he came up with the Amstrad PPC range or portable personal computer range, which we're going to have a look at now. And I'll explain to you what the connection is technically between this and that. And you'll start to get an idea of how Lord Sugar's brain works when it comes to pushing out low cost computers. The Amstrad PPC or portable PC sounds portable, doesn't it? was far from being the first portable computer or even luggable computer, which is how I would describe it. I think it's better described as a luggable, but it was the first to do it at such an absurd price. The base model is listed in magazines at under 500 pounds. Also like the desktop, it came in two models, this PPC 512, and in its original carry case, just look at that, is the PPC 640. Let's take it out and have a look. And you can immediately see that it's a different color. It's a darker gray than the uh, 512, the 640 here, even more so when you open it up. Oh, I really do like the look of that one, much better than the beige 512. Just like the desktops, the main difference was the amount of memory that was included, 512K or 640K as the name implies, but the 640 also came with a built-in modem. And the 640 is a far nicer example than mine. Mine is still in the queue for a deep clean. I need to give it a good scrub, but the 640s come from the Swindon Museum of Computing where they look after things a whole lot better. So that's why it's in such a nice condition. So if you hadn't already guessed by now, these are essentially those two Amstrad desktop machines shoehorned into the portable design. And I say portable loosely, it weighs six kilograms, which is the same weight 
as the base desktop model. They have the same NEC 8086 clone CPUs with the same slot to add an 8087 maths coprocessor, the same RAM, the same CGA compatible video as the PC 1512. Granted, if you look inside, you can see that some thought has gone into redesigning it to fit in here, and it has the additional power circuitry, which is inside the monitor on the desktop models. There's no PSU inside the desktop. That's all inside the monitor. So they've had to work that into these portables. And of course, the key difference is that it has its own built-in display in the form of a nine inch Super Twist LCD, which has no backlight, but in my indoor environment, it's pretty readable for static text. Obviously things get a bit blurry when things move on the screen. But you have to admit, with a full-size keyboard on this massive hinge here, it's perfectly usable. You could type all day on that. Now there's no hard drive inside and there was the choice of one or two floppy disk drives. These are three and a half inch 720K disk drives. And actually my 512 here has been upgraded to have both drives and also a modem in the back. And the 640 also has two drives. Again, looking much nicer in that darker gray. And around the back, we have the usual ports that you would expect to find on a desktop PC. They're all there, but also there's this extra port which offers a direct line to the PC's ISA bus. So you could buy an external cage that sits with it and you put your ISA cards in to expand the PC. And there's also a CGA monitor port, so you can add a monitor and enjoy a color display. But if you did add those two things, the overall size would be bigger than the desktop. I mean, you can't even get the base unit on its own on a train, can you? Is that possible? Well, according to the marketing, apparently you can. And to do that, you need to load it up with 10 C-sized batteries, which in real world use would give you, well, about one hour of use if you're lucky. For such a cheap portable, that's going to cost you a huge amount in batteries. No, this was far better suited as a portable that you took from office to office and plugged into the mains. It really isn't practical in the same way that a laptop is or a tablet in the modern day. It's a completely different beast altogether. But we do have to give it its due. It did what it did at a price that others couldn't match. So Alan has his desktop now and he has his portable PC, which was far less successful than the desktop. It didn't make anywhere near as big a splash as that desktop computer. So he must be done with tinkering with the PC 1512 uh, setup. He, surely he's done with it now. He's made his money. He's going to move on. Well, not quite. What he wanted to try next was the wedge. Now, at first glance, this really excites me. I love the look of it. It, it just works for me. And it's branded as a Sinclair, you'll notice, and not an Amstrad, or at least it was here in the UK. It was released in the US as the Amstrad PC-20. And that version stuck with the lighter color plastics that we've mostly seen so far today. And this was a really odd switch around because in the US, the Amstrad PC-1512 was also launched over there, but it was launched as the Sinclair PC-500. So they were using the Sinclair brand. But now this is released in the US as the Amstrad PC-20 and in the UK as the Sinclair PC-200. So they, they've switched the branding around. I don't know why either. Uh, my guess is that because Sinclair is so closely associated in the UK with the ZX Spectrum, and Amstrad of course bought Sinclair Research so they could use that Sinclair brand, perhaps he thought he could invoke the spirit of those Spectrum owners because the ZX Spectrum was a low cost machine as this was, just £300. Perhaps he could persuade them to upgrade if it had the Sinclair brand on there. I, I don't know what his thinking was behind it. But clearly in the design his thinking was that he could put this wedge up against the more familiar wedges that we know of the Atari ST or the Amiga 500. That's where it would have sat in a shop up against. Would I have swapped this for my Amiga 500 in 1988? Of course I wouldn't, how dare you ask such a question. I loved my Amiga, but it's not just because of my personal connection with that, it's just purely from the specs. This couldn't hold a candle to the multimedia specifications of the Atari ST or the Amiga. And I think you know why. It's practically the same computer once again, the same PC 1512 and the same as the PPCs with the same 8086 8 megahertz CPU, the same 512K of memory, the same internal display adapter with support for CGA and MDA modes. It's quite simply the same machine. There are a couple of notable differences though, if we look inside, and they are that we now have a PSU inside the case because it didn't come with a monitor. So the PSU had to be in there somewhere, either an external brick, but they chose to put it inside. It does make it 
very sort of heavy on one side. It's, it's very unbalanced in its weight. But um, the PSU is in there and it didn't come with a monitor because you could plug in a CGA monitor and we can use the same old Amstrad monitor here into the port at the back. Or another unusual thing for a PC, an IBM PC compatible, is that it has an RF modulator. So you can plug in any TV and get that 16 color output on a television. I have played with this and I couldn't get a picture on both at the same time because inside under this flap, we have some dip switches and you have to set the dip switches according to what kind of output you want. CGA, uh, TV, monitor output, you can't do both at the same time, unfortunately. And while we're inside here, you'll also notice that we've got two 8-bit ISA slots. So you could add ISA expansion cards in here, but if you've got just standard ones for any old IBM PC compatible, of course they're going to be a lot higher. So you'd have to have the flap permanently open, or no doubt Amstrad designed their own cards or intended to design their own cards, which would be really long, the length of the case here and low, low profile cards to use those. Um, and then you take the end off there and you have access to your cards. Now, I really quite like that. I wish they'd done that with the Amiga. I know it might have slightly ruined the design with the clean lines on the Amiga, but um, we had a trapdoor slot on the Amiga 500 underneath. It would have been nice if you had like a low profile Zorro slot in the Amiga 500. That would have been a really nice touch. So I like that but I'm veering off topic. The point is it's unchanged. It's the same machine yet again, repackaged. And it's even less attractive now because it's 1988. The original PC 1512 came out two years earlier in 86. So when that came out, yes, it was low priced in 86. It was already a low spec, but you could justify it because it was so low cost uh, compared to anything else at the time. Two years later, it's still that spec. It's even more out of date. Yes, it's cheap at 300 pounds. But you just wouldn't, you just wouldn't. If you saw this in a shop, and I remember seeing these in the shop, mostly in the bargain bin, you kind of laughed into your sleeve a little bit when you saw it up against the competition in the same price bracket, the Amigas and the Ataris, or the big jump up to the big boy PCs that were 286s and 386s, EGA and VGA graphics. It, it, it couldn't hold a candle to anything unless you had a very specific single purpose that you wanted to do on this machine. Uh, I don't know, again, I, I keep coming back to WordStar. Perhaps you just wanted to use WordStar. But even then, Amstrad had a hugely successful range of PCW uh, word processing machines dedicated to that, which were also very low cost. So you've got to have had a very specific reason to have wanted to buy one of these things. And of course, very few people did, and it didn't sell very well. I think it's time, Alan, to retire this hardware platform and to move on, mate. You've flogged this horse. <laughs>And so what we've enjoyed today is three machines which on the face of it are very different, but actually as soon as you scratch the surface you realise they're pretty much identical and it's been an interesting thread to follow. The PPC, portable pretty much in name only given the size and weight of it, and uh, the wedge, I will pick the wedge. If I had to pick one of these three it's the wedge and it's on looks alone because there's nothing to separate them technically really. I put a GoTech in the side, a floppy emulator to show you Maniac Mansion there, and also owners of this uh, the holy grail really is a low profile VGA card and ad-lib sound card to extend the capabilities of it. It's still an 8086. It's still only going to be, you know, so powerful with that CPU and the amount of RAM that it's got in there. But I just love the look of it. So that's why I would go for that one. Let me know which one you'd pick. When I showed this before, there were lots of stories about how this was the gateway for a lot of you out there into IBM PC ownership. What about the PPC or the PC200? Did you own one? Share your war stories with me in the comments down below. Were these innovative products? Not really. These were classic Alan Sugar who loved to repackage cheap electronics in a way that made them look like they were worth more, 
put them into a price range that was affordable to more people and hopefully pick up that share of the market. That's that's what he did with hi-fis, with computers, with everything else. That was his thing. So no, these were not setting out ever to try and change the world just to grab a share of the market. He achieved it with the 1512, not so much with the others, but they were innovative insofar as they came from a time when manufacturers were willing to try these different styles, no matter what was lurking underneath the surface. As always, I hope you enjoyed today's show. Take care and see you next time. Bye-bye. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's episode and if you happen to like that snazzy QR code shirt and pockets where I'm wearing, then head over to dresscodeshirts.co.uk who kindly sent that in to me. For a great range of technology-inspired fashion, you can find a link in the video description. 